God! Oh, thank you so much! Thank you! Welcome to Revolution for Movie Live! All right! Oh, thank you so much. So, we are here in Portland, Oregon. My name is Chris Losarenko. Some of you might know me from some of the bands I've been in, like Eyelids or Guided by Voices. And somebody at the concession stand said they recognized me from being in Death Midget. So, there's that. Uh, some of you might know me from my video store that I ran for 22 years, Clan Street Video with Tino O'Neill. And um, that was really hard to close. And so this was kind of me starting this podcast where I was asking people to talk about music films that meant something to them um, is really me missing being a video bartender and talking to people at movies and also just my life in music. So when I mentioned to Peter I was going to do this podcast, I was like, is there a film you'd like to talk to me about? And he said, does R.E.M. have a documentary? <laughs> and I said, yes, you do. <laughs> and he goes, do I have to watch it? <laughs> and I said, no, you don't. And so that's Peter Buck, right? So I would like to welcome Peter's one request. As he comes down the aisle, he wants everyone to sing the Darth Vader theme. <laughs> You'll see it, but for real. Here he comes. So, <laughs> Peter Buck, everybody. Right on. Silence. Silence. We can, we can sit down. down. Thanks. That was great. Good night. That was really. I should just leave. That was just better than I could ever been possibly imagine. Well, Peter, you missed a really good movie. Uh, but you lived it. No, I was. Um, the film it? is amazing, right? Uh, the film is told through archival footage. It's told chronologically, but it's pulling articles and interviews from all different eras to tell the story. And it covers so much, but we're not going to talk about anything that was covered tonight. There's some stuff I've always wanted to ask you, so we'll get right to it. Um, one of the things is many of us discovered REM when we were in our youth, when we were younger, when a time where music is so defining us and protecting us, and it's a shield, and it's our big identity. I was just curious, like, as a young music fanatic, what were you like as a music fan when you were young? Contrarian, insane, and absolutely correct. <laughs> um, all the music I liked when I was like in 1973, I still like it all. I mean, to one degree or another. But I, I saw liking the outside stuff, the stuff that didn't exist in Roswell, Georgia, as a way to define your personality and learn about the rest of the world that didn't have anything to do with music. Right. Were there any transformative bands or shows that were like lightning to you? Oh. I mean, I saw them all, but I, I remember seeing a show, and it was a great show. Mott the Hoople, New York Dolls, and Aerosmith opened. <laughs> and, you know, the line I was in, I was like, I went up front. There was me and about five guys in dresses, and we were just going insane. I just went, yeah, I found my world. This is cool. <laughs> That's in Georgia. Right. In 1973. You have no idea what it was like. So how young were you when you first started going out to, like, arena shows and things like that? Were you just, like, hitchhiking to get there? How were you getting into these things and staying out late? Well, uh, gosh. Um, you know, we would take the bus from Roswell, Georgia, into Atlanta when we were 13, 14, or 15. And then, you know, there were like five parents who had to rotate picking us up uh, downtown Atlanta, which, you know, white people never went there because it was a scary place for white people that lived in the suburb. And it was just bullshit. It was just that full, oh, I hated it. But I did it for years. I mean, I, I got picked up after the doll show by my friend's dad, you know, who was, <laughs> ended up 
Uh, well, <laughs> Did you ever get stranded at any of these shows or anything like uh, that? Yeah, that same dad left us. And um, <laughs> we had to see 10 years after. And, we, you know, we were all 14. And we all had really long hair. And, you know, we were thin and all that. And this limo pulls around the corner and the window rolls down. And this guy goes, hey, girls, what are you doing? And one of us goes, man, I'm waiting for my fucking dad to pick me up. The window rolls up and it goes away. So... When you were young, did you dream about being in a band? Was there a band you were like, I would love to be in? Well, you know, everyone in my generation, it's just the exact same story. What was it, February 7th, 1964, The Beatles. That was it. That, and, you know, I didn't have the highest expectations, so I heard that John and Paul wrote the songs, and they were the lead singers, but George, he kind of stood at the back. And I thought, well, maybe I could do that. Maybe I could stand at the back. I didn't realize how much later that he was a really good singer, guitar player, songwriter. But that was my ambition. I'll be the guy in the back. <laughs> What's well, so funny? Because you don't seem like a guy in the back on stage guy at all. Like, uh, like when I saw you, I was just like, I was really focused on your You know, I don't know. I mean, every, everybody acts the, the image they want to be. Yeah. And... I'm pretty good at it, but I still am not really good at, you know, like meeting new people or, right. you know, whatever. So that right. was my job. Yeah, I'm going to learn how to do this. What? So when you were going to Athens, did you go there to go to school? Or what, what was your, what did you feel like your future was before the band started? What did you imagine yourself uh, doing? Huge amounts of drugs and alcohol and an early death. Um, okay. While working at a record store. Okay. Um, but when I ended up moving to Athens, I'd been playing for a long time, and I'd been writing songs since I was 14, and they were horrible. But they got a little better, you know, and by the time I was like 18 or 19, I think it was 20 when I moved to Athens, I was actually writing a few things that I thought, you know, these, uh, these are okay. You know, they're, they're not much worse than songs on records that I like. Right. Then I met Michael, who is the best singer on earth, yeah. no matter what anybody says. Yep. And, you know, all of a sudden, these crappy songs that I was moaning like a dog <laughs> became these real things. And then I met Mike and Bill. And those three guys, Mike, Michael, and Bill, I think they knew they were pretty good, but I had played with a lot of people, and I knew they were great. I mean, I just absolutely knew, hearing them play, sing, that they were great. And Amazing. if it took handcuffs, these guys were not getting out of my room. <laughs> did you I mean at that point the underground bands had such short lifespans you know Mission of Burma things like that you know Pylon they burned hot then they broke up could you imagine a career in it did it even seem feasible or did you see this as like a short term this is fun for now I think if you'd asked me when I was 20 what my goal would be it would be uh, you know because I, we, we lived in the south so you know listening to, I don't know, listening to these southern bands that just came and went, that was one thing. But I kind of thought, well, maybe maybe we could write a couple songs, and maybe if we're really lucky, we'll get to go to New York and have a couple singles. And then, man, I'll go back to the record store and, you know, happily take my life apart. Right. <laughs> you mentioned to me that you used to play a lot of what was called New Wave Nights. What the hell was New Wave Nights? Were you just kind of lumped in with other kind of synthesizer bands? Being a guitar band, were you, did you stand out at the time? No, they were, um, every, pretty much every one of them was a gay bar. And, and on Tuesday night was na New Wave Night. So you'd get these young guys in with makeup and play and everyone had a great time. And then, you know, we'd get our 110 bucks and go home. And it was, it was a way to make a living. And we did it seven nights a week. So the economics of being in Athens at the time where you could sleep in a church and live on top of each other is, was important. We did live in a de deconsecrated church that had some rooms in it. And I sold blood. And I occasionally still worked at the record store. And we did gigs. And I had a friend who worked at the taco stand. And he'd see me come down the line. He'd count my number. and 
my burrito would be five times as big as anyone else's burrito. <laughs> and that's how I lived for just years and years. I lived in my car for three months. Uh, there's many a lovely young woman that who, you know, at different times were friends of mine that allowed me to sleep Al, maybe not al fresco, but at their place. And, you know, I just didn't, I just thought, that's the way it goes, man. I'm broke. I'm a guitar player. I'm in a band. We're cool. Did you have the dynamics? Did one of you, was like one of you the driver, and one of you like a shitty driver? Did someone write the set list? What was the dynamic of putting the early stuff together to just get out on the road? You know, there's this thing that I always read in articles about rock bands, that rock bands are like sharks, that they need to keep moving or they die. And that's just bullshit. Rock bands are like donkeys, and they need an asshole with a whip to stand right behind them. <laughs> and unfortunately, you can only guess who the guy with the whip was, which engendered a lot of resentment, but it was the way it worked. Did you make the set list then, too? Were you? Absolutely. And, right. You know, when, when we recorded our first record, I had like a whole notebook of the list of the songs in order of the like 20 songs we're thinking about. And it was just like you would do in high school. It's like, oh, we, maybe we'll start with romance because no one's ever heard and whatever. You know, and, and actually the, the one we used is one that was in my notebook. It would kind of have to be since there was only like 15 or 20 songs and I had 200 pages. When I was younger, you sent me a list of um, potential album titles for Reckoning. So, and I wanted, I guess you would put a thing on the wall. Yeah, yeah let, me, let me say this. We put it, something on the wall and we would write whatever stupid thing came in our mind and it was never serious. But my guess is Trolling for Olives is on that one. Let's see, uh, there's uh, Big Pete's Greatest Hits. There we go, and uh, I didn't even write that. The Cows Come Home. A lot of stuff like Cries and, Cries and Whispers and Alphaville, like a lot of movie stuff, trolling for all of That's Bill Berry every fucking year. <laughs> Usually with a picture, too. Only seconds away. But I, my favorite one for Reckoning, R.E.M. 2. <laughs> so, but it is funny, um, you know, Reckoning is on here. Um, but the other one I really liked is Only in America. So. Well, there's a great song called Only in America that was written for an African-American group by, uh, I can't remember if it was Man and Wheel, but it's one of those. And it's black people singing about only in America can a young man grow up to be president and, you know, run the, the country and how great it is. But it was a protest song. And the record company went, yeah, you know what? That sucks. So let's get some white guys to do it. So Jay and the Americans did it. Wow. And, you know, they had some sweaters and whatever and then we recorded it for a michael moore movie years later i didn't know that which which movie was it uh the one where canada invades america oh yeah the, the, you know right. a huge fucking hit in <laughs> toronto and those areas right <laughs> well as you can tell tonight and you can tell in the movie rem were so comfortable in interviews like that was one of the things that really drew me when i saw you know, there was such a mystery around the band in my head, getting the albums and the artwork and seeing photos of you live, but then seeing you on like David Letterman or that live wire footage where you're, the kids are asking questions, you were just so comfortable. How was it, were you, were you all that comfortable out of the gate? Honestly, I thought I was the only smart person in the United States. <laughs> I knew I asked a good question. Unfortunately, I became to realize that that wasn't even close to the truth. But, you know, there was, I just felt there was a war on, and my band was leading this war, and we're going to say what the fuck you want to say in the place you want to say it, and if you don't like it, you can kiss my ass. And, yeah. You know. Well, it's funny, because, uh, you know, I would collect all the magazines and stuff like that. Do you, does anyone remember Musician Magazine? And I, I, like, to me, that seemed like a really, it was like trouser press or something really high. But I found, I bought a couple recently to just own them before this, this thing. And I was like, here's, this is a picture of R.E.M. And they're like in a, like a little rascal's house. And it says, R.E.M.'s Boys Club. Beer, girls, fun, and rolling with the scam. 
And it also at the top says, if Jim Morrison lived. <laughs> and then this, the other musician one is R.E.M.'s Double Visionaries, are Peter Buck and Michael Stipe seen eye to eye? And it just, I was really surprised at like how antagonistic these articles were. In fact, there's a section here that says, where they ask each of you, which REM song would you refuse to play? Uh, Wendell G. That's exactly right. <laughs> that would have been 40 years ago. Yeah. So. Michael Stipe says Catapult. Bill we Berry says Harbor Coat. We play that all the time. And Mike Mills says Hyena is absolutely one I refuse to play. We play that too. <laughs> I know. But Mike says, it's so funny, he goes, Hyena is one I absolutely refuse to play. I really don't like to play time after time. Harbor Coat, I just got sick to death of it. I probably wouldn't want to play second guessing. I never like to do letter never sent. <laughs> End of the paragraph. What was it like to like, have people just write shit about you? Well, the understanding was, oh, this stuff is gonna, you know, uh, it's gonna be in the toilet or the garbage in like in a week. I mean, certainly no one's gonna remember this stuff. And I don't really have to worry about what I say. I'm just gonna say it. Right. And here we are. Yeah. yeah. Well, I, I think in the, in the film it shows just you're super honest. Like, that's one of the things I loved about it was there was no pretense. It was like, yeah, you, you, you want to ask us about, um, was anyone here when they, play, when they did Two at Four at, at KTU? They, there was a show here, a local show with Jeff Gianola and Margie Belay and R.E.M. were on it twice. And every time you were on, they asked the same questions. They would be like, so what does R.E.M. stand for? What about these weird band names like Jodie Foster's Army? What do you call your music? And Mike Mills says, we're critic rock, because critics like it. But you guys were just so patient. It's hard to level the ignorance of the critical audience in those days. Not the audience that listened to the band, but the people who fucking ran the radio stations and wrote this shit, they were morons. I mean, they were fucking morons. <laughs> Every fucking one of them. If you were really lucky, you'd get like, a, like I have five, six friends from those days that were journalists, but generally, they were just fucking idiots. And what they did is they took the press release and then they read the article that had written previously about us and then quoted it back to us. And you're sitting there making fun of these fucking morons and they were so stupid you didn't know you, that you were making fun of them. And you're just like, yeah. I mean, what am I supposed to do? I, I can't, I. Uh. So what does REM mean? Rear end men, we're totally gay. Thank you, thank you. Were you, were you always split up? It seemed like you and Mike did a lot of interviews and then Bill and Michael would do it. Was that a decision you made, like to split up the division of labor? Or? It was a decision made by uh, Michael and Bill who wouldn't do it. So okay. then, <laughs> you know, and me and Mike were like, well, okay. But they'll pay for the plane flights in the hotel, right? And buy us dinner? I mean, I guess there's worse ways to work. <laughs> uh, but, I, but I, you know, honestly, all this talking about something that really I, I couldn't define verbally or, or literally or intellectually, it was just bullshit. I mean, and we were just going, yeah, we're going to go talk some bullshit to a bunch of people for four weeks, and then the record will come out, and then that bullshit will get us on some crap radio station that plays bullshit music, and then we're going to go on tour and play to people who like us. And that's all it was about. <laughs> so, some of you might know this, but Peter and myself were, I was a pen pal to Peter in 83. I wrote, when I got that first REM single, I wrote to the REM PO box, and I got stuff back. And I brought some stuff. Um, uh, so please, please delete the idiotic stuff I wrote. Yes, about. don't worry. No, most of this is is just uh, it's very sweet. Um, thanks a lot for writing. We've never played Oregon before, but maybe we will soon. Thanks for buying our record too. No, the video isn't quite finished, but should be on MTV in a month. The other picture is for your friend who hates the band. <laughs> 
then you guys would just send shit like this, like an envelope with Michael Stipe writing official REM paper clip on it. And just send, I just get weird shit in the mail every month. Chris, thanks to you and your family. Thought you might enjoy this. Michael, it's a little murmur postcard. Yeah, but the thing was, one of the greatest things Peter did was send me a list of bands to check out. And some of the bands he told me to look out for are The Neats, Husker Du, The Replacements, Safety Last, Pylon, OOK, OK, Jason and the Scorchers, Let's Active, Minutemen, Rain Parade, Dream Syndicate, The Last Roundup, and this was my favorite, Hardcore DC Straight Edge Punk Rockers Minor Threat. Which is why I bought that record, because of this guy here. And I feel like a lot of us heard about the Velvet Underground through you. Like, all of a sudden, I was like, oh, my parents have this record, shit. I will I say, mean, if I had sent you that letter, like, five years later, it would have had Miles Davis and Laura Nero and all kinds of sure. different stuff. But I lived in the punk rock world, and that was the world I lived in. Well, and you were bringing these bands on tour with you, too. I saw I, so many amazing bands you gave, like NRBQ. Um, the uh, Minutemen. Minutemen. D. Boone. Yeah, amazing. Uh, and I feel like that felt like such a mission for the band is to just like be like, we're putting an NRBQ on this bill. It wasn't music, necessarily. I just felt like the 70s were fucked up. But, you know, there's something cool about them. The 80s, it was horrible. And it was, it was all like, oh, we're going to wear brown suits, make a lot of fucking money, and empathy and sympathy for people. That goes right down the fucking toilet. And when I have, like, a letter from a young kid, I just think, okay, there's a war, and I could tell this kid about this war. That this, there's a way to live your life with poetry and empathy and love and punk rock and whatever. And so that's what I did. It, I think R.E.M. changed the, many of our lives, and one of the amazing things, <laughs> my dad didn't tell me at the time, but my dad would, I would write these letters to R.E.M., and he would mail them from his, his office, but he would Xerox my writing without telling me. So here's a letter I wrote to R.E.M. right when Reckoning came out. Dear Michael, Pete, Bill, Mike, Jefferson, Burtis, and Hindu love gods, it's incredible. Reckoning is as good as Murmur and even better. It has a different texture for every song. I was like 15, okay? No two songs sound alike. I'm glad you did that. I think most people will expect Murmur Part 2, but it grows on you just like your other albums did. But still, all your trademarks are there. The vocals, enough said. <laughs> the melodic guitar and bass, and the punchy drums. Each song has different techniques, and it's great. Ballads, happy songs, country, folk. The songs are better written than Murmur's too. I was afraid you may change your style too much, but even, even, even though the words have become a little more decipherable since last time, they still remain their form, which I meant retain, but... Keep, okay, get ready for this. Keep the words personal, Michael. <laughs> and, the, and the kicker? Your vocals have really improved. Take camera or time after time, for example. I'm so glad the album's a success too, but I hope it's not the end of your cult days. I, su I see people finally buying your albums, but it does take time for some people to realize how special and talented you are. Of course, your fans are behind you and, will and hope you keep touring. I can't wait. My parents are allowing me and driving me from any place you play in Oregon, Washington, or Idaho. Look me up when you come here. And they sent us a backstage pass. So my, my parents would go, and me and my brothers, and we'd go backstage, young rockers. And we'd be back there and go, oh, Chris, that guy that has all those letters in his last name. 
he and his parents are showing up. Hide the beer, and, you know, anything else. Good Lord. Try to pretend like we're normal for like 20 minutes. It was amazing. I, I mean, I, obviously, it was just so nervous. And it was really fun when we got to reconnect as adults. And um, you just told me tonight we were at the, we, you played the Pumpernickel record release show with the Minus Five. And then the second time we met as adults was at the Savoy. We were at the Savoy. The, the woman I was dating's sister was the best friend of your current wife. Yes, Joe. Thank God I got that right. Because if I <laughs> fucked it up. It would have been tough. Good night! <laughs> but um, Chris goes, hey, Peter, do you remember me? And I went, I don't know, man. I, I meet a lot of people. What's your last name? And he goes, Slezarenko. I went, holy <laughs> shit, you're that guy that has all the letters in his name from Portland he used to write letters to. Yeah. And here he sits. The other amazing thing about REM was they started getting big and they started having bigger and they started having to not, they weren't able to write as much and so they had like fan club issues and things like that. But I'd still get things from them like, um, what's the news your way? Haven't heard from you. And I'd be like, oh shit, I gotta write to REM. <laughs> you know? Chris, send us a compilation of the Mystic compilation when it comes out. Good luck with Death Midget. What are you going to major in at college? Are you going to Evergreen? So these things, as you can imagine, just, oh my God, just getting that was a total lifeline because at that point there was no one in my life except my brothers to share our aim with. No one in my high school liked it. But the fact that you took time to write to people and were so encouraging, and I think people who have met you like, Back in the day, at shows and things like that, everyone has a has a story about meeting the band, and it's yeah. And I'm a total asshole. <laughs> no, I mean I think most people would disagree, but yes, maybe. but maybe not. <laughs> Laugh all you want. It's okay. Yeah, it's okay. I mean he is Darth Vader. Um, so, and I remember. In the documentary, there's so many leaps you take, and it, it seems like, it almost, it, it, in a weird way, it seems a little effortless in the film. Like, you get great reviews with your 7-inch, and then you, American Bandstand likes it, and then you're on, the album isn't, Murmur was in the top 40, and then you were, the, like, the number one band in, you know, the album was picked in Rolling Stone, and then you talk about, like, making out of time, and being like, no one's gonna, or, or uh, I'm sorry, um, Automatic. You're making automatic. You're like, we're making a weird record, and then it's a hit. But it seems like the stuff seemed really, like the timeline seems really effortless. And did it seem as surprising to you, like as these, to me they seem like giant leaps, but they're always going forward. You know, honestly, the like when things were going well, yeah, it's it felt effortless. And the minute they started going bad, it was fucking hard work. Right. And it wasn't even that bad, but it wasn't. You know, I made at least one record I'm really ashamed of. And uh, no names, you know, but uh, <laughs> I guess we could probably guess which one it is. But, you know, it just, it got really hard. And it wasn't necessarily because we had less of whatever it was. It, we had less of what it took to agree upon it. Right. And I'm quite proud of the last couple records we made. They're amazing. I remember, yeah. <laughs> Reveal, Accelerate, they're incredible. So I really uh, appreciate you just let me slide right over the shit years into, <laughs> into the good stuff. We all slide over the shit years, Peter. <laughs> we all do. <laughs> um, I wanted to talk about like how you wrote some of the songs, like how, like a song like Harbor Coat is just crazy. Like there's ska elements, there's like picking, it's fast and then it gets really beautiful. Was that stuff like written in like a, as a jam or did you how did how did how did those songs come together as much as i'd like to say that everything that was great was written by me that's not really true right so um i i do remember harbor coat we were opening for the english beat and all we fucking heard was fucking ska every goddamn day <laughs> Makes and, sense. and then all of a sudden it's like oh sound check and then we got the song that's just doing that right and it wasn't really i, I admired the band intensely but it wasn't something we really planned to do. It just right. that kind of thing happened. Well, 
Did the lyrics ever, did the lyrics or vocals ever come before a song? No, never. So how did you how do you write a song like Man in the Moon into the Void and kind of know where the energy is going to be or what the emotion is? Well, it got harder and harder because Michael used to write the lyrics fairly quickly after we'd come up with the music. And then it got to the point where it was like a long time and it was hard. Man in the Moon, we were doing that record, which was automatic for the people. And uh, the whole record was finished. And Man in the Moon was in the sequence. No words whatsoever. Slide guitar, background vocals. And Michael goes, man, I need a week. I went, well, we're rich. Take a week. <laughs> so, you know. I rented a car with Kevin Kenny, and we went and played acoustic guitar in the shittiest bands across eastern Oregon and northern Vegas. And Michael, I don't know what he did. I think he just drove in circles somewhere. And he just walked in the first day and sang Man on the Moon, and that was it. That's amazing. Yeah, I know. And I was just like, oh, because it wasn't going to be on the record 10 minutes ago. Wow. <laughs> was that exciting or infuriating? <laughs> Oh, it, you know, it was it was in, uh, unbelievably invigorating. Yeah. Unbelievably. Of course, I was pissed off that it took like six months to get there, but <laughs> that's just the way it works. And Michael, Michael works on inspiration, and he isn't inspired every day. I, I just work every day, right. and I'm not inspired every day, but I throw shit away, and Michael just doesn't. So he it'll take him a long time to finish things. Okay. Wow. Did anyone own the REM VHS succumbs? So this was a videotape that you put out. I remember that. Yes. And at the beginning, you and Jefferson put <laughs> down. I'm so embarrassed. Yes. Here's the script, Peter. I mean, you're well, going to Do I have to read it? Yes, you're Peter. OK, I am Peter. So <laughs> okay. I, I, I'm Chris, by the way. So. Oh, so you, wait. Yeah, you're I'll, reading Chris. I'm reading. Oh, yeah, you exactly. Go right in. So, imagine we're like coffin-like arms folded over. Our chest I had a, I had a turtleneck on in the yeah. dark and yes. light on my head. Yeah, and then the, our eyes open. Peter, Peter, they're here again. Welcome, citizens of the future. What you're about to see is an important historical artifact. Do you remember the hula hoop? The Edsel. Or Nehru jackets? Neither, Neither do, we. do we. What you're about to see is a representative sampling of an outmoded art form. Which will stand the test of time equally well. The video. Oh, the video, sorry. So, I loved REM's videos. I thought they were incredible. Well, what did you not like about being or doing them? Uh, well. Like, the, you know, the little secret is, I have never seen an REM video or live performance all the way through. Yeah. Never watched them. The other guys go, what do you think? I go, you know, I don't know. It's pretty good. And, uh, and they go, well, we like it. Like, oh, that's cool. Yeah, and <laughs> because I don't like the way I look. I don't like the way I talk. I don't want to know about this shit. I hate it. It's fucking over. Let's just... Let's just not have arguments about this crap. Well, there's a reason I mentioned Clockwork Orange earlier, Peter, because you're gonna sit in the middle there, we're gonna strap you down, we're gonna open your eyes, and you're gonna watch the fucking movie again. Let's hit it. I will say this, I have one great memory of doing a video, and that was, we did Man on the Moon, and um, they basically like, you know, I was, I was a bartender, because I can't do anything, I can't act, whatever. But the guy in front of me was this Western actor from the 50s. You might know him from, or actually nobody under about the age of 80 will remember him, but he was on that TV show Police Woman, but he wasn't Earl Holloman. He was the guy with the flat nose. Anyway, he was in every Western movie in the 50s, and I must have seen him a thousand times. And I was playing a bartender, and I was in a bar. It's like, what the fuck am I gonna do? So. You know, we just started like pouring drinks, and then it was like, well, beer. Like, yeah, you're not really supposed to give them drinks because, you know, we're closed. It's like, 
yeah, right. Who's going to tell me that shit? And next thing I know, it's like shots. And, and he was some of these stories about, yeah, man, I did a movie with Barbara Stanwyck. She had a great ass. <laughs> you know, and, and, and I'm just man like, on the moon. this guy's totally cool. So we, did, we, we hung out for like four hours. And I don't know if you could, I've never seen the whole video. But uh, I would imagine if it's in chronological order, order that I get a little less <laughs> rational <laughs> in my movements. But I, but I had a great time. And whoever that guy was, and I'm sure you could look him up. I mean, he said every Western movie in the, in the 60s. He was a great guy. We got bombed, hung out. And then we went to some other bar, which even worse than when we were in, and got fucked up. Right. <laughs> and I ended up kind of like on the floor of like a like a Holiday Inn in the Mojave Valley, just going, did that really fucking happen? At least he wasn't in the room with me, so. Also, when the movie was playing, Peter was in the lobby, and some of you will speak to this, I'm sure. Anybody who was buying a drink while the movie was playing, Peter bought. Right? Which I thought was a great story within the story. So. I would assume that anyone's watching. And everybody watching. look under their seat. <laughs> Peter's bought something very special. You might see some keys. To Chris's house. To my house. What's the address to again? the rest of my REM collection. I'm giving it away. Um, so what we're going to do is we don't have a ton of time tonight, so I appreciate your patience. But we do have time for some audience questions. Gus, Gus Berry, who's been doing sound, would you come out please with the microphone? Give a hand to Gus Berry. Thank you, Gus. And here's where it gets weird. Right. But they're far enough away that they can't throw a Frisbee at us too hard. So. Wow. So nobody's gonna speak in All right, that here fucking we go. thing. That's great. Since nobody's taking the chance, I'll, I'll step up. I was watching the movie and thinking um, a formative moment in my life was seeing you guys play a bridge school with Neil Young and the choice to play Ambulance Blues with him, um, which I think was probably released on a seven inch or something, so probably more people are familiar. I'm just wondering how that came about, and well, the next day I ran out and bought the On the Beach, and I've been a Neil Young fan ever since. So You know, we said, yeah, we'd be glad to do it. Uh, we'd love to play with Neil, and you know, Neil, uh, I would assume he has a phone, but you know, he's not contactable. But um, you know, so I just sent a fax to like his personal assistant's second best friend, I don't know. And it was a list of like 20 songs and it was all stuff he never plays. Revolution Blues and Push It Over the Edge and uh, Flying on the Ground is Wrong and all this stuff. And they said, well, just stand by the phone because Neil's gonna call you. I'm like. Like, you know, when? And they went, well, you know, like today or tomorrow. <laughs> All right, you know. I answered a bunch of spam calls, and then there's this phone call, and he's like, hey, man. Uh, Neil? He goes, yeah, man. <laughs> so, did you get my list of songs? He goes, yeah, man. I said, what did you think? He goes, man, you're going real down with all that stuff. It's just all down. And I went, yeah, what's wrong with that? And he goes, I don't, I don't know, man. I mean, it's all right, but I don't know. And I said, well, you know, I mean, we, I could play all of those songs. And he goes, well, you know, maybe we'll just talk about it. And we started rehearsing Revolution Blues. And, you know, he doesn't speed through the songs. And, you know, it's like a 14-verse song. And about the 12th verse, we might have picked it up to one BPM, and he just fucking stopped it. He goes, no, man, it doesn't get any faster. <laughs> and we're just like... He's like, should we start at the beginning? He goes, yeah. And I was like, okay. Amazing. And then we just have to look at each other and go, uh, don't get excited. I mean, I guess that's what the whole point of it was. And you know what? It's a great performance. So he yeah. was right. Yes. So I, I've seen you more times than I can remember. 
um, I mean, well, more, th more than I could count. And first time I could, I saw you was in 1986, Dallas, Texas, State, uh, the Fair Park Band Shell. Do you happen to remember that show? <laughs> I actually do, uh, but also the best place in Dallas was the Bronco Bowl. Yeah, yeah. It was actually a bowling alley. Yeah. Amazing. So I'm, I'm, I have this very distinct memory. I'm pretty sure it was you. So y you were playing Superman, and you had a cape on. Nope, not me. No cape. A ain't going to happen. I have a cloak right now. I'll exhibit <laughs> it later. No cape. Okay. <laughs> all right, all right. So I'm just wondering, so that was uh, Life's Rich Pageant, and you were, uh, so that was a relatively small venue. When I tell people that I saw you there, they can't believe it. W what other places did you play on that tour? Like, that would be a 86, that. I mean, you know, we, we were popular like the college world and played kind of bigger theaters, and then we'd go to like Norway and play to 130, really confused Norwegians and 25 Americans who thought, this is the greatest thing ever. <laughs> and that was what my life was like. Also, I made no fucking money that year, not a penny. Yeah, but by the time they came to Portland, the first time that was Reckoning with Starry Night, Roseland, then they moved to the Schnitzer for Fables, and then by the time Life Church Pageant came out, they were at the Keller. And then the next time you came, it was like the uh, uh, Memorial Coliseum, I believe, for Monster, so. yeah. Cool. When Collapse Into Now came out, uh, I noticed all these uh, videos started popping up of um, what I take was the recording session maybe in Berlin, but all these really fierce uh, recordings of the songs, and I was wondering, is that the last show that I replayed, and what was that show about? Yeah, we um, hadn't told, the three of us hadn't told anybody that the band was breaking up, and we were just finishing a record, as far as anyone knew. but. We knew it was the last thing. We weren't going to tour. We were done. So at huge expense, we hired these people to come film us in front of four people. And nobody, including our, our manager, really understood what was happening. But we wanted to have a film of us playing together as people that loved each other at the very end of the road. And we did. And it's out there somewhere. Cool. Hi. Uh, hello. Uh, <laughs> I'm here because I promised my friends I would talk to Peter Buck. So. Cool. Well, <laughs> you, you've already won. You got I it. I did it. Yeah. Hundred percent. So I have a question to ask, whoever. Uh, I myself am a guitarist, and I want to know what is your favorite guitar to play. You know, honestly, I bought a guitar in 1981, and I played it on every every REM record. Every session I've done, every live show, it's a Rickenbacker 360. And, <laughs> and it's, it sits on my bed at home. Unfortunately, no one or nothing else does. But that's OK. <laughs> Perfectly fine. But it's, it's the guitar that I go to. So that's, that's the one. I mean, it is the one. It's a 1961. Rickenbacker 360 that I have used on every record I've ever made. Wow. Thank you. Goodbye. Good question. Hello. Good evening. Hey, man. Uh, so one of the uh, debates that REM fans always have are the IRS years versus the Warner years. But the question is, with Green, the fourth song is Stand, but it's listed as R. Is it? It is. And it's always come across as either being quaint or someone describing it as a typo. But if you actually say the letter R and the song name, it's R Stan. So is there anything symbolic with that being a stake in the ground from the band perspective? Or is that conspiracy theory uh, talk there? And uh, it really was a typo. You got this. Peter. The answer is yes, no, and maybe. <laughs> but I wouldn't be super shocked if Michael did that, because yeah. Michael was really into like slipping little things in there. But if you had asked me what the song was called on the record, I would have said "Stand." But you know, eh, it's not my record. It's our record, and it's your record too. 
Uh, all y'all own it. I don't own it anymore. Good question. Thank you very much. I got a couple follow up. Uh, are you, you have a question or? Well, okay, last question, then we'll have some follow up here. Oh, so. We could go all night long. 3, 4 a.m. That's right. The totally people cool. here love it. The people for it. Oh, yeah. All the people that are waiting for us to get the fuck out of here are just happy. Hi, Peter. Thanks for being here. Hey. Um, you are very noted for playing that Reckenbacher your whole career, but what other guitars are you using these days in your solo and new gigs that I should be thinking about buying? Uh, you know what? Honestly, Rickenbach guitars between the years of 1960 and right now, they haven't changed like the factory or the people. I mean, yeah, sure, people have died, but they're really put together really well. You could buy a great Rick for like $2,500. I mean, a good one, a good one like I've got. Um, but you know what I've been loving playing is a. Uh, it's sentimental. I, when my friend Bill Rieflin was dying, uh, passing, um, I used to just go visit him. And we'd go have lunch and then go play guitars. And he liked this guitar. And it was a 1958 uh, Gibson Les Paul Jr. And, I, you know, I just called him and went, hey, you know what? Why don't you just send that guitar to Bill's house? It'll be my gift to him. And so it was his home guitar at the end of his life. And then it was in the will for me. And it's one of the two guitars I have in my bedroom that I play regularly. So it's not always the neck or the tone or the, it's the value that this, this thing you put into it, that my friend Bill, who was dying, put into it. Maybe there's a little bit in there, and I, I play it kind of every day. So I'd say, you know, you'll never get to buy it for me, but the Rickenbackers are good. <laughs> well, and yeah. you've been playing a 12-string Eastman. Isn't that as well? Didn't I see something like that, too? Pardon me? A 12-string Eastman? A 12-string Eastman? A 12-string Eastman. I thought I saw something like that you've been using oh, yeah, uh, quite a bit lately. Yeah, I got one of those. I, I've got a bunch of 12-strings. They're impossible to play. I hate them all. And I get hired all the time to do it. Yeah. You Thank do you. love the Good Cells right now. Well, the Good Cell amp is the best amp ever made, and the guy doesn't make them anymore. And I own like 20 of the 100 of them. It's amazing. So, hey. <laughs> it's like boutique person. And who has one? It was so cool. I wrote to them when I was 14, and I said, someday when I'm 55, will you give me an amp? <laughs> no, I'm kidding. But uh, they are great amps. They are great amps. And you can, you can find them once in a while on Reverb, and that's what I did. So um, I have some kind of even dumber questions than I've asked already today to wind out the night. Um, Earlier tonight, we were talking about our love of music narrative films like Wild in the Street and Privilege and things like that. If there had been an REM narrative film made, who would you have liked to have seen star as Peter Buck? Either Peter Lorre or Sidney Greenstreet. <laughs> and they're both in a lot of films together. Peter Lorre is great. Yeah. Yeah. Nobody knows what it's like to be me. Yeah, we went and visited his grave last time we were in LA. Yeah, his grave's nice. You've seen that movie. Oh yeah, hell yeah, yeah. I don't know if any of you had REM culture shock when you were younger, but I mean, seeing REM early on when Michael was hyper but very shy, and then going to see the Green Tour and he's got his shirt off and he's gyrating and dancing across the stage. Did you? Did that transition into that kind of performer shock you at the time? Or did, was that like, that's Michael, and finally it's kind of like, here it is? All four of us were completely out of control during <laughs> the 80s in every way, except that we worked every single day of our lives. And yeah, who knew? I mean, I didn't know he was going to do that. I didn't know I was going to turn into what I turned into. <laughs> and then I turned into something else, and now here I am. And <laughs> goodness. Yeah, it, it's interesting. It is. So, I don't know if any of you have heard the podcast yet, Revolutions Per Movie, but at the end, thank you. At the end of every episode, I ask the same question, but I tailor it 
depending on what the film is. So Peter, I know you love this film. It's one of your favorites, you've seen it many times. So on a scale of from one to 12, how many strings do you give R.E.M. by MTV, the movie, on a scale of one to 12 strings? I'm trying to take this seriously. Yeah. Um, I'm in it, zero. <laughs> That's what I have written down here too, it was a zero, right guys? But, it's a 12, oh yeah. But, you know, I, I got so lucky. I met those amazing people and made records that I'm, and music and performances and whatever we did that I'm incredibly proud of. And it's also like a dream that happened to me when I was a butterfly instead of a caterpillar, you know? It's right. all great, it's all cool, I love it, and I don't think about it at all, and I hope that in some way it means something to some of you people that... Totally. <laughs> Absolutely. Because that's, that's the only reason you do it. I'd say, I, I think the majority of people here, REM, changed their life in some way. Changed um, mine. And it, it shaped my life through the band's kindness and their interviews and their political viewpoints and just the expansiveness and teaching me about different types of music and just the generosity of the band. It was really apparent that they were, they cared a lot. Okay, I, Chris, we're really about done with this like kiss no. my ass bullshit. It's, but it's I, about am I over, right? I'm not wrong, am I? Does R.E.M. mean something to you? Does Peter Buck mean something to you? Thank you, everybody. Thanks for coming out to Revolution's Burn Movie Live with Peter Buck. Thank you, everybody. One thing. I'd like to say one thing. Y'all mean so much more to me than I can ever mean to you. So thank you very much. Thank you for listening to Revolutions Per Movie. We release new episodes every Thursday. And if you've enjoyed this, it would mean a lot to me if you would rate and review it on your favorite podcast app. The show is a completely independent affair. So the best way to support the show is through our Patreon at patreon.com slash revolutions per movie, where you can get weekly bonus episodes and exclusive goods sent to you just for joining. You can also follow us on social media at Revolutions Per Movie and find out more information about our various guests in the episode show notes. Thanks again, and we'll see you next week. Bye. Bye.